Okay, session been recorded. Okay. Now, during the uh, uh, session right now, if there is any questions, uh, go ahead, guys, please speak up, and I'll stop, and then we'll listen to your question and answer your question as well. Okay, so uh, please don't hesitate to do that. And then here and there, I will also stop and make sure that, you know, I will ask questions, uh, you know, with you guys as well. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the first one here, which is uh, data center switching protocol. What's available inside the Nexus operating system? Now, uh, from the very beginning, okay, we are now looking at uh, the layer two uh, protocol. As you already know, uh, most of you probably have the uh, background on it already. The spanning tree is very important uh, for, the, uh, for the network overall as far as the layer two. Okay? And so uh, the spanning tree is there by default. First thing first, right? The purpose is to prevent loop always. Okay? And so uh, now because of that, within the Nexus operating system, okay? Um, uh, particularly now you have some other uh, uh you know like a switches out there it's not a nexus but it's just an ios uh you know operating system but it's a layer two as well okay so there are certain you know a spanning tree uh protocol is on by default okay now for the nexus okay the rapid permanent spanning tree is actually uh on by default however if you are running the latest uh, releases the rapid spanning tree is on by default, but if you run in a little bit earlier releases on the Nexus, okay, uh, chances are the per VLAN spanning tree is on by default as well. So you uh, sort of kind of have to look at uh, which uh, switch or switches that you have currently running, okay, particularly for the data center is a Nexus, okay, but some other uh, a vendor out there are still having the iOS, uh, you know, careless switches that is running iOS. And it's, you know, might not be the default as far as a rapid. But at this moment, we are looking at, uh, you know, the uh, rapid permanent spending tree protocol. Now, let me stop here just a little bit, okay? Because, you know, later on, if you are going to take tests, chances are they're going to ask you a lot more about different type of a spending tree protocol, to be honest, okay? And so let me go ahead and, 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 and detail it out just a little bit, uh, a few minutes here. Okay, original spanning tree is actually 802.1b. Okay, that's the original spanning tree. Okay, and then uh, uh, the IEEE already take this and expand them. Okay, and so now the next one we call them as a rapid permanent spanning tree. Okay, so that is particularly called it 802.1w. Okay, so that is a different type of a spanning tree. However, there is also another one. Okay, we call them as a 802one S, which is multiple spanning tree. Okay, so different type of the spanning tree, and they behave a little bit differently. Okay, but the original was still able to that one D. That's the original. Okay, and so uh, now at this moment we are looking at the rapid. Why is it the keyword rapid? Okay, a little bit of a history now. Okay, uh, from from the original when the I triple we came out with eight hundred two that one D. Uh, originally, uh, if you have like a multiple, uh, you know, VLAN, say you got 10 VLAN, and then by default from the original, you have one instant of the spanning tree for all the VLAN, okay? And so because of that, if one VLAN get problem, the rest of the another nine VLAN will get affected. And so a little bit of the history means that Cisco say, okay, that's really not good enough. So what Cisco did, will extend the 802 that one the originally from Cisco, okay? And so now with the, with the uh, uh, per VLAN spending tree, okay, what they did was they say, okay, for 10 VLAN, we're gonna have 10 different instances of the spending tree. So every VLAN has its own spending tree. The good reason for that is that if one VLAN got a problem, the rest of the, the other nine VLAN will not get affected, okay? And so IEEE look at it and take that as a proprietary from original from Cisco and extend them to make them as a per VLAN spending tree. Okay, so that is the concept, guys. Now this is a key uh, feature now that you might see it on the test. Now the keyword plus is actually a very important one. When you see the keyword plus, that is Cisco proprietary, even though originally. Per VLAN spend tree is Cisco proprietary, but now it's already became standard. And so what Cisco did more after that, it put 
additional proprietary feature within the per VLAN span entry. Okay, so now you see the keyword plus. Okay, now because of that, why is the keyword plus there for the reason? Uh, for example, if you have a certain say the switch number one, you have a, a say switch number two. Okay, and then for now, for example, you connect them together. What happened now? Okay, so now assuming again that maybe switch number one is Cisco running per VLAN span entry plus. Okay, and this one is switch number two is not a Cisco switch. It could be some a non Cisco uh, a switch uh, vendor, could be Broke or whatever it is. And so what happened now if this switch number two is still running 802.1b, okay, as an original. So now you can see that every time when they extend a certain thing, right, the format of the uh, span entry will be different. So because of that, let me summarize here. Because of the way it is now, what happened if this guy is a switch number two running original span entry? And they're going to try to generate what we call as a configuration BPDU. Okay, and they're going to send it to the switch number one trying to establish the neighbor. Now, because of that, the format on the BPDU between switch two and now, switch one received that and said, oh, that's not uh, the, the, uh, the, the span entry that I'm running, which is permanent span entry plus, okay? So therefore, with the plus sign, when Cisco put it onto it, they're gonna go ahead and take that format and then bring up the original 802.1b and try to interoperate with the well, uh, uh, you know, switch number two that is not running permanent span entry plus. So that's the reason for the plus sign, is for interoperability, okay? So that's a little bit of a history there. So you gotta take this because in the test later on, if you are going to do that, you might be able to see those kind of questions. That's important, okay? Any questions, guys? Just wanna make sure you guys are with me. Yes or no, guys, still? Let's see here. Okay, thanks guys. So yeah, I just wanna make sure you guys understand. Just, uh, you know, ask questions if you can. This is your opportunity, okay? It's very, very critical because there's a lot of people don't know what that is, okay? And that's the reason for it. Now, a little bit later, you can see that not even running 802.1b, what happened to this guy running rapid span entry and this guy running uh, 802.1s, say for example, but they're not Cisco. Uh, you know, the Cisco and non-Cisco. The Cisco always has the proprietary feature for interoperability, okay? So now, let me go ahead and move on to the rapid, okay? Now, because of this, from the beginning here, whether you're running 802.1d or are you running per VLAN span entry, it doesn't really matter now, okay? Now, before the rapid, okay, what's gonna happen is that if you look at the picture here, Okay, because the span entry, if you look at here, is a loop, right? The span entry is there to prevent loop. And then because of that, uh, within the span entry, there are several parameters that is automatically there to, you know, to, uh, to prevent loop for you. Let me summarize a little bit about this, okay? If you turn on those three switches, okay, the very first thing they do is try to generate the configuration BPDU, which is stand for Bridge Protocol Data Unit. That's what they do first. They will exchange the configuration BPDU among uh, each other. So that because of that, the whole reason that they are doing so is that they have to select, okay, the root bridge. That's always, okay? Now, at this moment, within the BPDU, as far as the configuration, there is a priority and there is a MAC address combined, okay? We call that whole thing as a BID, okay? So that's a bridge ID. Okay, that will consist of, again, the priority, okay, and also the MAC address, okay, combined together, okay, to make the whole thing as a BRIS ID, okay. Now, because of that, by default, the BRIS, uh, the, uh, the priority on all switches, okay, is equal to 32768 by default, okay, every one of them, okay. And now, because of that, if you don't modify and, and dictate which uh, switch or switches to be the root bridge, if you don't change anything, okay, and the, and the priority are all equal by default, the next thing they're gonna look for is a MAC address, okay? So now they combine both of them to make it as a bridge ID, 
whoever has a lower MAC address will become the root bridge by default, okay? Unless you modify the priority. Let's say I want to switch number two to be a root. Absolutely, if you do so, okay? And then because of that, you leave the lead two like a switch the three and, and one to be the default priority and you modify the switch number two priority to be lower than 32768, then of course they will eventually become the root bridge, okay? And when they become the root bridge, every two seconds, they will send out the BPDU between the switch two to the three and switch two to the one. And if you are not a root bridge, you have to receive the BPDU that comes from the root bridge. Okay? So that's a little bit high level summary of what, how they are doing that at the very beginning. And then after that, they will determine, okay, which you know, link or interface or interfaces of the non root bridge have to become, you know, the blocking. Okay, now within the spanning tree, we have the blocking. Okay. Okay, we have learning. And then uh, we have listening. And then we have a uh, forwarding. So every one of these, uh, you know, uh, stated that they have to go through. Okay, between the blocking and the, le and the learning. Uh, 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 actually blocking, listening and learning, I, I got messed up here. So listening here, okay, and then for learning here, okay. So because of that, between this and that, that's 20 seconds, blocking to the listening. And then between listening and learning, that's another 15 seconds. Between, le uh, between the, uh, learning to the forwarding, another 15 seconds. So this whole thing, okay, originally take about 50 seconds, five or longer for the interface or interfaces, right, from the blocking going to the forwarding. So that is a timer by default, okay? Now, because of that, I'm going back to the rapid now, okay? Because of that, before the standard, Cisco uh, say, okay, that's really not good enough, okay? Uh, let's take forever for any interface of the any given switch from the blocking to become forwarding take about 50 seconds or longer. That's a long time, okay? And so what Cisco did back then, okay, what Cisco came out with, let me go ahead and erase this and then uh, have more room to uh, uh, redo it again, okay? Uh, for you guys to sort of kind of understand this a little bit. Um, So because of that, with all the things that they have to go through and Cisco say, okay, that's really not good enough as far as a rapid uh, becomes standard, okay? And Cisco came up with the, what we call as an uplink, uplink fast, okay? And they also have the thing called it the backbone fast. That's the original, okay? So now because of that, right, we know that there is a blocking and we know there is a listening, and we know there is a learning, right? And we know there's a forwarding. Those are, those are the things that they have to go through. Okay, now with the uplink fast, okay, if this is the case here, okay, because if we have, uh, you know, we have the, uh, uh, the blocking could be this guy, assuming this is the root bridge, right? And this guy is not a root bridge, so he's gonna definitely be a, a blocking here, say for example, okay, and then everything, uh, you know, forwarding just like that. But this interface got to be on blocking, otherwise you got the loop because there's no blocking on the root bridge, okay? And so now, because of that, it could very well mean that, hey, because of that, this guy can be a blocking depending on how the spreading tree does it, okay? Automatically, based on those parameters, okay? So now, because of that, when Cisco came out with the uplink fast, uh, say between this and that, right? Or maybe this is the blocking, Right, you see that right there, right? And then now what happened if this is forwarding and then of course now it's gonna be uh, uh, having an issue. How long will this uh, link between the switch one and three to uh, go from the blocking into the list, uh, into, the, uh, into the forwarding? Now you can sort of see right here by default, take 50 seconds or longer. That's a long time for this link to become active because this is a problem right here, right? So with the uplink fast that you implemented from the original Cisco proprietary, then, of course, now, uh, when that happens, it's going to bypass from the blocking, go all the way to the forwarding almost immediately. You're talking within microseconds. That's how fast it is. Okay? That's uplink fast. Now, for the backbone fast, originally, okay, uh, and Cisco implement the backbone fast, is that the only thing about backbone fast is that they still got 20 seconds 
okay, out there. But they wipe out the 30 seconds, which is 15 seconds between listening, learning, learning to the following. So those 15 seconds, both, right, which is 30 total, they're going to wipe that out and they're going to go into the forwarding. And the only thing that they have on the backbone fat originally was 20 seconds, okay? But the uplink fat will go all the way, okay? So I triple we looked at it and say, I think that's a very, very good idea. Why don't we incorporate that into the existing pervalent spending tree and make that as a standard? And that's the original. And that's now it is a standard. So if you're doing a rapid spending tree, it's already have these in there for you already. So whenever there is a problem, you know, certainly will go into the forwarding almost immediately. That's what we want, okay? It was original Cisco proprietary, but now already became standard, which is rapid pervy and spending tree. Um, it's already a standard, but if you are running Cisco switches, Cisco put more stuff into it with the plus sign, okay? So now it's a rapid pervy and spending tree plus, that's Cisco, okay? But rapid pervy and spending tree without the plus, that's standard. Okay? which is any other vendor besides Cisco who will do that as well. Okay? So that is how it how it's originally came from, and, and that's why you see that as well, as far as the history behind all of this. Okay? So now, for example, because of that, like I said, now we back to this again, right? This is the blocking, this is forwarding. You can sort of see right here. This is forwarding because if you are not a root brisk, you have to select the root port. Okay, so in other words, uh, so between this and that, what's the fast way for me to get back to the root brisk, which is between this and that, that's direct, not between this and that and that. Okay, so that is its root port and it's forwarding. Now, all interfaces in and out of the root brisk, assuming this guy is, right, will also be the, um, you know, the forwarding, okay, uh, on the root brisk by default. And so this is the root port forwarding. Now, from here, what is the fast way for me to get back to the root bridge? Well, it's got to be this way right here between switch one and two, but not go via the switch three and then back to two again. Okay. So therefore, now because of that, uh, this is the a root port, which is right over here, and it's forwarding before the a problem here. Okay. So now this is the blocking, which is, you can see it right over here. Okay. So there have to be a blocking somewhere. Now, if you are in a blocking uh, mode, what can you do? The only thing you can do is to receive the BPDU. You are not allowed to do anything else, okay? You are not to allowed to participate in the topology chain. You're not allowed to do anything, okay, until you come out of the blocking mode, okay? So that's what the whole thing here is. Now, because of that, between this and that, we got a problem. How much longer will this become uh, a forwarding for us? Now, with the rapid, it's immediately, okay? So that's a little bit of that, okay? There's a still a little bit more in information that, as far as how the spending tree operate the way it is, okay? So uh, now, because of this, you can see the picture on the, on the right-hand side here, okay? Again, we know there is a problem, okay? And we know that this thing was in a blocking, we need them to go forwarding immediately so that, you know, we don't have the traffic. You can think about underneath any one of those switches, there are traffic. Okay, they are endpoint. So we got to be able to do that as well. Absolutely. Okay. So that is a little bit of a high level as far as how they work. Uh, um, but there, are, like I said, there is a lot more detail into that as well. We may not have time to kind of explain more and more because a spending tree is complex protocol. Okay. We just have to understand how it op op operates so that you can try to avoid the issue, the problem. Okay. So that's a little bit about that. And um, any questions, guys, or any more specific questions? Guy, all good? All right, so let's move on, okay? Now, because of a spending tree, okay, when you, when you turn on those switches, absolutely everything is there. You don't really have to do anything, okay? Uh, you don't configure because it's on by default. <coughs> what we are looking at right now is a security feature so that we are trying to prevent bad things from happening inside our either the core or an aggregation or, you know, the uh, distribution uh, switcher switches, okay? Now, from the very beginning, okay, 
the, uh, the, the, the feature that is available within the spanning tree protocol, you can see right here, okay, is what we call is a BPDU guard. The BPDU guard is a feature within the spanning tree. That is a security trying to prevent problems, okay, from happening. Now, think about this right here, because these are the switches, right, or that already connect as far as your backbone and your core and your distribution. Now, usually behind those switch or switches, there are endpoints like server, uh, bare metal server, uh, hypervisor server, those kind of VMware, Microsoft Hyper-V, those kind of endpoints, okay, that's supposed to go into the switch. Now, because of that, um, uh, from the switch, assuming you are going to uh, uh, configure different VLAN and put them into a different broadcast domain, right? <coughs> and so, if there are nothing happen as far as a bad uh, 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 traffic, right? They just send it in because these uh, endpoints do not understand spanning tree. They don't run spanning tree, okay? And so, you know, if there are no, you know, malicious activity or something like that, then it's really easy to kind of like, uh, bypass that, but because of that, some of these endpoints, okay, uh, the attacker out there are very, very bad, okay, they are trying to, <coughs> excuse me, they are trying to uh, uh, spoof your environment, and then they are trying to take over, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the spanning tree, okay, so from, from let's say from the uh, attacker, they have a lot of uh, a software, advanced software, lots of tools that they can try to do those kind of things for you, okay? So if this is the case here, they can uh, try to, uh, uh, and they know that they connected to the switch, and of course, you know, they're gonna try to spoof your environment, and if they know where the switches are or the certain VLAN that they need to get to from here, they have the tool to do those kind of things, okay? So now, because of that, with the, with the uh, BPDU guard, we are going to turn it on so that if that is the case here, bad guy, right, it's not going to happen, okay? Because technically, from here to here, uh, the switch does not, you know, expect to receive the BPDU because this is not a switch. This is the endpoint, okay? And so if you enable BPDU guard, when, when, when the switch see that right here, because this is the, uh, you know, non switch, it's not supposed to receive the BPDU because this guy can generate that. And so when you enable BPDU bar, when that happened, right, the switch gonna say, well, wait a minute here. Uh, this uh, this uh, you know interface that I received BPDU is not connected to my uh, my neighbor switches based on the table, right? So therefore, when this happened, it's gonna try to do something for you. In other words, it will probably try to disable those interface or interfaces that is coming in uh, to the switch. Uh, that is a BPDU because it's all about spending tree is beginning with the BPDU, okay? And so uh, that's what that is. So we have to be able to uh, uh, identify the, the security feature and try to prevent a bad thing from happening. Think about more now. What happened if this guy explore your environment and now they want to become the root bridge? Because everything has to go to the root bridge. All the traffic okay, have to go to the root bridge. Because of he is a bad guy, he's out there, and he's trying to become the root bridge, and now all the traffic Okay, within your core and so on, have to go through him and he examine everything. And then eventually he's gonna try to, uh, uh, you know, attack you, okay, and try to get to the certain application that is on a specific uh, VLAN and so, okay. So we don't want this to happen, okay. We have to identify and enable, uh, you know, the features so that we can protect, you know, you know, bad things from happening inside your, your switch environment, okay. So that is a little bit about BPDU guard, okay. And we have to enable those kind of features. This is only one out of many features that is available within the spanning tree, okay, that we have to identify and protect our, um, you know, uh, uh, environment. And like I said, there are multiple, okay. Uh, this one is actually a, a little bit about BPDU filter, okay. This whole feature of a BPDU filter is this, okay. Assuming again that, you know, this is your uh, switch environment. So what happens if you are going to connect what you control here to another uh, topology that is also running spanning tree, okay, where maybe you don't control this end and they don't control you, just an example, okay. There are a lot of vendors out there have their own uh, switches inside your, uh, your, your, your environment, your, your premise, okay, your data center, and because you don't control each other, 
Okay, now because of that, if you don't try to prevent, because these are the switches that are connected together, and by nature of that, they will try to generate the BPDU because they detect that there are switches and we can do so as well. Okay, so now with the BPDU filter, okay, you can also identify this and disable the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, disable the feature so that they do not send BPDU within those two switches where you don't control, uh, you know, the environment on from one over the other. You can see this is your network, this is somebody else, okay? And so if you don't want that to happen, you should be able to identify the BPDU filter so that you can actually prevent the switches from generating a BPDU between the two because you don't control from here, you don't control this, from here, they don't control this, okay? We don't want them to explore the environment because of that. So you have to identify and turn on that BPDU filter. That's one of the features as well, okay? And like I said again, guys, sometimes this is what you are looking at. And if you don't have this kind of uh, environment, you don't worry about those uh, filter, right? Because we don't have those kind of concepts. We only have whatever inside here that we control completely. Okay? But we don't worry about some other unless you have this kind of, uh, you know, environment. Okay? And so that's what that is. Unless you want to completely separate them, even though you control both and you don't want anything to do with it, then of course you can turn on a BPDU filter as another option as well, okay? Now, one more thing, guys, okay? Any given switch can belong to one and one domain only, never more than that. So assuming this is the scenario, if you have this whole thing belong to the single domain and the other one belong to another domain, say for example, and it is all part of yours, if you don't want them to interchange and so on, right? You want to segregate them or separate them, you can go ahead and, and do so as well. That's another option that you can also use BPDU filter to do those kind of things. Okay. Now, there is another feature, we call them as a root guard, okay? Now, this particular uh, feature is uh, almost the same as a BPDU guard. The BPDU guard that we look at it two slide back is that if the endpoint starts sending in the BPDU, which is not supposed to be, okay, if you enable that, that interface will become disabled, okay? It's not good anymore. Now, for the, for the root guard, because we already have the root bridge, and those are the switch of switches that we dictate, and that is our core switch, and they are the root. <coughs> <coughs> so because of that, if you are going to look at this and say, okay, I have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, inside my uh, switch, I have a root bridge already been selected, okay? I have some other switches that is actually there for us as far as uh, our uh, backbone could be the case. And so, uh, because of that, we don't expect the root bridge to be changed. No, we don't, okay? And so now with the root guard, if anybody wanted to become the root bridge, now with the root guard, if you enable them, okay, then of course now you can see that, hey, because of that, that's not going to happen. It's going to become root inconsistent. Let me give you another example off of this as well. So what happened if, what happened if, okay, uh, uh, somebody, you know, out there with the interface is already up and running, okay, they have another switch, okay, uh, we call it uh, maybe a, a switch number five, say for example, okay, and we have no idea what that is. And then, now, one more thing before we do this, by default, all interfaces on all the switches, okay, are unable by default. They are not like a router, okay, all interfaces on a router are administratively shut down. But because of that, all interfaces on the switches are unable by default. And by default, they belong to VLAN number one, okay? And so that is the default. So what Cisco recommend to secure your environment here is that whatever interface or interfaces, whether they are, uh, you know, a trunking or they go into the endpoint, whatever it is, then be it. Whatever the interface or interfaces is not being used and they are up and running by default, Cisco recommend identify them and shut them down. And not even that. Okay, configure unused VLAN, could be like 1000 VLAN or 999, 900 VLAN or whatever that you don't use, assign those VLAN into those interfaces and shut them down. So that anybody 
uh, that trying to connect to your switch, which is the production switch with another switches, they are not going to be able to make it. If you don't, then of course they will be there. Okay. And so we even without a root door, this guy, you know, with the lowest priority, they can become the root risk for you. Even though they are switched, they're not like this, but they are switched. Okay. And somebody else can do that. Okay. So with the root door, you don't want that to happen. Say a, a new switch that you're not aware of it is just coming in, and now they want they want to become a root bridge. That's not a good thing. So with the root door configured like this, if this guy is the case, right? That's not going to happen. So the root door, the root bridge, is still the way it is. And and of course, this interface, if you configure and enable root door, this interface will become root inconsistent. Okay, it will be there for you. It, this is all feature that is available for you to identify and protect your environment. That's really come to that. Okay. Question, comment, guys. Okay. This is important for some of you guys eventually take tests. So be careful with those. Okay. Okay, we have another feature that is also available so that we can identify and protect the problems. Okay, now the thing we're looking at right now, what we call as a UDLD, by the way, okay, a unit, unique directional link detection, okay, unit directional link detection. That's the feature that is available for us to identify the physical failure. <clears throat> that is actually connected between the two switches. Now, say for example, the way it is right now, everything's good, right? You got transmit, you got receive, okay? Uh, the way it is, and everything functionally, functionally correctly, all right? And now, what happens if any given switch, even any given interface or interfaces, okay? Now, particularly for the fiber optic, you can see depending on the type of the fiber optic, like transmit, the receive, there might be in a two different, you know, uh, connection because of a because of a fiber optic. Okay, and what happened here? Uh, this guy, uh, you know, the way it is, is you can send and receive, right, on both switches. So what happened here? If there's certain interface on certain switch that all of a sudden, right, they got a problem as far as I cannot send anymore because my transmit is gone. But this guy can still send, I can still receive on a switch too, but I cannot re uh, reply or send it back because of, uh, you know, could be the transmit or the receive depending on, okay? So that is the problem as far as that. So therefore, we have to be able to identify this feature and then be able to, you know, configure so that if there is a problem here, the interface will become disabled so that we don't run into loop. That's really the whole thing about UDLD. So that's what that uh, UDLD look like, okay? And we have to be able to identify that and then be able to enable it so that we can detect if there is a physical problem. You never know what can happen between those uh, those switches on the specific, particularly if you have a copper, right? They're usually not an issue, but fiber optic, they're very, very fragile, very, very fragile, okay? They can be breaking and so on, right? And then eventually you got a problem, okay? As far as a physical, okay, between the two. So that's the UDLD. And so more on the same here, okay? The way it is, is that, hey, you know, because of the way it is here, if there is a case, right? This, now they introduce another thing here is that this is supposed to be the blocking, you look at the spanning tree, and this is the forwarding, forwarding, forwarding everywhere, except for blocking it, otherwise you got loop, right? And so all of a sudden, in this uh, issue here, right? Uh, this is supposed to be in the blocking, but uh, you know, eventually, if there is a problem, you know, they are going to do this. And of course, now everything is forwarding, and now what are we running into? We got to run into a loop because this is supposed to be in a blocking for whatever reason that is, okay? He's not doing it anymore, okay? Now, wait a minute here, okay? So this is supposed to be in a blocking, but because of that, right? Uh, if you are in a blocking a few minutes ago, I was messing about the blocking, right? If you are in a blocking, you can only receive BPDU. You're not allowed to do anything else, okay? But because of that, what happened if this guy, okay, I'm not sending the BPDU to him, okay, because the root here, say, for example, okay, this is coming down to that from the root port, and then also, at the same time, it's also come to this as well. And this switch number two, if it's not the root bridge, he's supposed to relay that BPDU to this guy, 
Okay, so from, from the switch number one, he received uh, uh, you know, B3DU on both interfaces, this and that. And for what happened, that switch number two, for whatever reason, the problem is, right, is not sending the BPU to him. Now, how long ago? Okay, 20 seconds. Now, because of a blocking, within the 20 seconds, he had to receive the relay BPDU that come from the root bridge via switch number two, by nature of the spending tree. So if he doesn't receive within 20 seconds, guess what happened next? He's, gonna, he's not going to stay there within 20 seconds when the 20 second timer expires. Okay, he's going to start trying to go into the listening. And then after that, he's going to go into the learning. And then after that, he's going to go forwarding. So eventually, because of that, right, it looks something like that. And now everything is forwarding, particularly this interface. And now what do we have right now? We got problems, okay? So that's how, because of that, you have to be able to look at the UDLD and be able to do that. And then, of course, interface or interfaces will become, you know, uh, 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 disabled so that you don't run into the problem as far as a loop. Okay. That's important. Okay. Okay, so, so far we look at some of those features that is available to prevent problem. Okay. Particularly within the spanning tree. We have looked at the loop go already. Okay. And now there is another uh, feature within the Nexus zone. Okay. They call it a bridge assured. Okay. Now the bridge assert is available within the Nexus operating system, okay? and it is actually unable by default. You can see right away from, from, the, from the bullet. Okay? And so uh, now because of that, okay, uh, the bridge assert is there to prevent problem, loop, all kind of stuff. And so what Cisco did was composite multiple other a feature and now call it a Brit assert. And that's what that is here as well. Maybe an extension of idea that you to uh, for by the loop guard and we already know the loop guard and we look at it already. So with the Brit assert is there to prevent problem for us and that's already include the loop guard part of the risk assert and it is unable by default. Okay? And you, if you don't want it you can disable and then individually look at the specific feature like loop guard, BPU guard, all of that. Okay, but now with the bridge assurance is there, it's there to, pro to provide, uh, you know, the feature so that you don't run into the problems, okay? Even with the UDLD, we look at it already, okay? They work very well with the layer one problem as far as a physical uh, layout, okay? So that's what that is. And then a little bit of the recommendation underneath here where they say that, you know, you use the UDLD and the bridge assurance, they work very well together to prevent what? Loop to prevent a problem for us, okay? Against what? Again, the physical failure, because they work together, you know, between the bridge assert as a loop guard and now the UDLD, they work together so that if you are running into a physical problem as well as a spending tree issue, right? Uh, they are all there to prevent the problem for us, okay? So those are all, these, all of these are just features to prevent problem as far as a loop, inconsistent, whatever that might be, that the problem might be, but you, you might have to identify additional uh, thing that you are going to do, like security, port security, and those kind of things as well, okay? So there's a lot of feature, a lot of uh, security, by the way, is there for that to happen, okay? So, uh, so that's just, uh, you know, introducing into the, uh, uh, you know, spending tree and a little bit of that as well. Now, the port channel, Okay, port channel is very, very good feature that a lot, everybody out there are doing that. Okay, now before the circle here is a port channel. If you think about between these switches, and we have multiple physical uh, uh, connection between both of them, all, all of them, and from here to here we got two physical links without the port channel, right? And of course here to here you can sort of see that. So now from the spanning tree, okay. Without the port channel, because you, because of that, you know that you're not going to be able to utilize all the bandwidth because the certain link will be in the blocking and so on and so forth. You're not going to be able to utilize all the physical, uh, you know, uh, bandwidth between uh, those switches. So the port channel concept feature is there to to allow you to do all forwarding and utilize all the uh, uh, all the bandwidth that you have between those switches. Okay. So when you try to identify and create the port channel, okay, the port channel is a logical uh, interface. Everyone can 
it is a, a, a logical interface where when you configure the logical interface as a port channel, inside the logical port channel, you identify the physical connection between the two members. And those are what we call as a port channel, port channel membership. So because of that, from the spanning tree perspective, okay, when the spanning tree looking down to all of these right here, it's just a single connection between these switches because of port channel. Okay, but internally, every one of those port channels have multiple other physical members within that, and we can do all forwarding. Okay, we don't have to have the blocking because the spending tree only treat the connection as a one connection only, not as a multiple connections. That's a good thing about the port channel. Okay, so allow us an opportunity to utilize all bandwidth. Okay, all forwarding. You can think about these two right here. We have like a 10 gig each between them. Now we can use all, you know, or, or 20 gig between all of these right here, okay? Instead of a certain thing will be in a blocking and, and so on and so forth. And then not even that, the good thing about this is that if one member go down, we got another still remain within the port channel, we still got connectivity between them, okay? That's a good thing, okay? And so, uh, so port channel is uh, composite, all the interfaces between those devices so that we can util utilize them all, okay? And do all forwarding. Now, not even that, you can see right here, this is only beginning with two physical between them, right? We can have up to about 16 of those physical interfaces as a member within a certain port channel, okay? So there's a lot of free concept feature that is available so that I want to be able to utilize all my uh, capability between those two switches, okay? Uh, if you don't configure port channel, then of course, chances that you know right away that it's a spending tree is not going to let that happen. Okay, so that is the concept, that is the thing. Now, within the port channel, you can do a layer two port channel, or if you wanted to, you can do a layer three port channel. Okay, absolutely, you can do that. Think about it, guys. If, you know, if these are the switches, right, that is running a, a layer three routing protocol between them, we can do layer three port channel between them. Okay, if this is an access layer, which is no layer three here, and from here up, it's all truncated. And now because of that, we can, you know, configure the port channel between this and the two switches up here and make them as a layer two port channel. And then of course, between these right here, it's a layer three only. Yeah, we can do port channel that is based on a layer three port channel instead of layer two. So yeah, we can do layer two or layer three or both, okay? As far as the port channel. So yes, we can do so as well. And, and, and so the only thing about layer three here is that the IP addresses and all the policy have to be configured within the port channel uh, uh, that you configure between these two, not on the physical interfaces here between them, but within the port channel configuration, all the policy, all the IP is a layer, layer three. Even for the layer two, for any other policy that you have to implement between these uh, uh, access switch to here and so on, right? all have to be implemented within the port channel as a layer two as well, okay, for the layer two. Not on the physical connections, okay. The physical member is all about uh, setting the duplex and they make sure they match it between this and that and so on, right. Other than that, okay, you don't do anything on the physical uh, interfaces between this and that and so on and so forth. So all have to be done on the logical channel, port channel, which is either layer two or layer three. So that's what they are. Okay, guys, any questions, guys? No? Still good? All right, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, guys, so more of the same here, okay? Same thing. Uh, if you take a look at before the port channel, what happened? Well, we, we have the sw uh, switches that is physically connect between them. They can be 10 gig, is a gig, whatever that is, right? And if you don't configure port channel here, you know for a fact that you're not going to be able to utilize all forwarding and utilize all interfaces between these two, okay? Because the spanning tree, depending on layer two or layer three, okay? <coughs> you're not going to be able to do that. <clears throat> so now what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the beneficial and of course you know like i said out there everybody doing this because they want to utilize all the capability between them so we're going to configure the logical port channel 
And within that, we're going to identify these four interfaces, which is the physical, right, between those two, and then uh, to be a member of that logical core channel. And then from the spanning tree, this is the connection. Only between here is a one connection. It's a logical connection. Because the port channel is a logical interface, it's not a physical, okay? And another good thing again is that if any one of these members go down, we still get connectivity between them, okay? Now, within the port channel, there is a protocol, okay? We call them as a LACP, okay? Which is Link Aggregation Control Protocol. They are there to do a lot of things for you. They are there to do load balancing. They are there to do a maintenance if there is a problem. Okay, say for example, LACP is between these two on the port channel. If one member go down and they before they go down, right? We are already, uh, you know, LACP is already do a load balancing between them. You like all these four um, uh, member within them, right? And now one go down, the other three are still there. And what LACP does is gonna take a look at the traffic between these two right here and recalculate and reload balancing among the remaining members still exist inside the port channel, which is now three instead of four. And if another member go down, we got another two still there, and we still got connectivity between these two right here, okay? So that's a good thing about the redundancy, reliability, and of course, scalability, utilizing the port channel for it, okay? So, um, so that's what we are looking at as far as a feature av available, even though these are the nexus for you right there as well, okay? Okay, now, because of that, here we go again, okay, LACP is a protocol, okay, it, it is a lot of people are using protocol for that, however, if you don't want to use LACP as a protocol, when you configure port channel, you don't have to, okay, technically, if you don't use LACP as a protocol between the two switches, right, you are statically put, you know, those uh, connections between the two switches uh, uh, to be a port channel, uh, statically on, okay, and there's no protocol in between them, okay, you can do it that way if you want, but the only thing about that is that between the two, when you do so without the protocol, make sure that they are consistent as far as a, a like a, a duplex and whatever setting you have between them, you make sure you are consistent on those, okay, if you are utilizing a protocol, if you're not consistent, the protocol will be there to detect those kind of things and it will not allow you to have the port channel, but if you don't use a protocol, make sure when you put them into the port channel permanently without any protocol negotiation between them, then make sure they are consistent or else you're going to run into problem. Okay? That's why a lot of people are using protocol LACP when they configure port channel. Now, now within the LACP as a protocol, okay, uh, there are different modes you can see right here. Okay? Now, if you do so, okay, um, uh, within the LACP, there is a, a, a feature we call it as a passive. What does that mean? Mean that if two switches, right, that connected together, and we enable LACP, okay, and so because of that, when you configure them, okay, if they are passive, they don't respond to the packet. They will respond to the packet that is, you know, coming in from the other switch, okay, because they are hopefully you put them as an active, okay, the active one will automatically try to initiate the negotiation with the other switch. Okay, they will do that, but if you are on the other switch that has been a passive, you don't initiate the, uh, the negotiation, but you respond to the packet that is, you know, coming from the other switch as an active one. You can see right over here, okay? That's the only difference, okay? The passive does not initiate, but the active does, okay? And so, uh, 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 Cisco recommend if you do so as well, make both ends to be active so that you don't have to worry about it. But if you're gonna make both ends to be active, you're good to go. Or one end active, the other one passive, you're still good to go. But if you make both of them to be passive, you may not have port channel because neither one negotiate. Okay? Unless you don't wanna use a protocol, here's another option here called it the static. See that, does not send any packet because there's no LACP there, okay? So, um, and so that's what that is, and then, does not join any LACP uh, channel group when you configure because they don't have a protocol there because you don't activate them, okay? And of course, every uh, uh, link on every switch it will become the port channel individually, okay? That's all they are with no protocol in between them, okay? You do have an option to do those kind of things, but like I said again, 
most people out there, when they look at the port channel, they will have a protocol there as well, LACP, okay? So, uh, now as far as the load balancing, particularly using the LACP, okay? Uh, these are the things that they will consider for the load balancing, okay? For example, by default, okay, if you are looking at the layer 2 port channel, okay, they will automatically identify and consider the destination and the source MAC address at the layer 2, if they are layer 2 port channel, okay? So that's what that is, okay? Or in other words, you can sort of see destination MAC or in this case, sort of destination MAC all together as a layer 2 port channel. If you are looking at a layer 3 port channel, layer 3, okay, now they will also have the destination sort and destination IP addresses instead. Okay, together with that map and the that's an IP addresses. That's the default between layer two. This is the layer two port channel. This is the layer three port channel by default. Okay, as far as the load balancing, what information that is actually included to make a load balancing available. Okay, however, if you want to consider that is uh, above layer three, which is the layer four now, right? And when you look at it, right, that is now either TCP or UDP port number, okay, that is a layer four. This is not the default load balancing. If you want this to be part of the load balancing, you must go into the port channel and configure that so that they now include either TCP or UDP or both, okay, uh, a port number uh, to be part of the load balancing. Okay, that is not the default. But if you want that to uh, happen, you have to, when you configure, you include that. Uh, you change the default load balancing uh, behavior that now you want it, even the layer 3, I want layer 4 in the 2, you got to go in and configure that. Okay. So that is a little bit about the uh, information, what they included, part of the load balancing mechanism as far as uh, information. Okay. okay, we also have the major feature now, we call it a virtual port channel. Okay. Now, the virtual port channel is like this, okay? And so, <coughs> excuse me, now you see those two switches right here, okay? And these could be a 7,000 series switches, okay? Okay, so there can be a 7,000 series switches in both of them, okay? This is, might be a B side, this is, might be an A side, all right? So those are now within the virtual port channel, if you configure them, okay, both of these guys high level now, guys, right? work together, okay, to represent as a single logical switch between these two right here, okay? So every time when they send something down to the switch below here, they will come from the logical switch, not from these two right here. Because when you configure the virtual port channel, uh, both of these, one of them will be the primary, the other one will be a secondary, but they generate the logical switch between these two right here, so that, you know, that's what the virtual port channel look like. Okay, now for the switches underneath here to go up here, that's just a normal port channel, okay? Not as a virtual port channel. Now from here down, okay, that is a virtual port channel. That's why the virtual port channel only work between these two switches, okay? And so because of that, there are requirements, there are components that we have to identify, okay? First of all, the, the VPC peer got to be only two right here, no more than that. N not one, not three, but two only, okay, because of that, okay. So the VPC peer will be these two right here, okay. However, the connection between them, we call them as a peer link, you can see right over here, as a VPC, virtual port channel, okay. And that connection have to be a 10 gig east between them, okay. So at this moment, you can see how they do it right here. There's a two physical connection between them, and we got even port channel in between these two right here. And the VPC peer link is technically a layer two only, okay? And so now because of that, uh, the, uh, the VPC peer link, the whole purpose is to synchronize the configuration, all the uh, information between these two switches, including the dynamic information that it exists between these two switches. They will use the VPC peer link to synchronize all of that. So at any given moment, these two switches, you look at their table, the configuration, they are very, very much identical, okay? That's VPC, a virtual port channel. So we call between here and there as appealing, okay? All right, and then of course, there is another critical one we call it the keep alive link, okay? 
and Cisco recommend do not use VPC peeling between these two right here for the keeper line. And what Cisco recommend is come up with another interface on this switch right here and go up to your core and come down to the other one. That only for the keeper line link as well, layer three. Okay. So those are the major component and interfaces <coughs> between these two that you have to have those. Otherwise, virtual four channel doesn't work. Okay. And like I said again, the connection between this and, and these two right here, you can sort of see right here. Okay, allow us, number one, to terminate the connection on the different switches on the top as a VPC peering. Okay, now for the port channel, not the virtual port channel, okay, you can sort of see switch number one, uh, switch number two as a port channel here, right? This is only a port channel, okay? From the switch number one, we must terminate the connection on the adjacent switches, that port channel. But for the virtual port channel, we allow the, the connection to be terminated on the different devices. You can sort of see right here. Okay, this is the port channel. This is the virtual port channel. Okay, so that if one link go down from the from here down, we got another right there. You can sort of see that. Okay, and both of these work together to represent as a, a you know virtual uh, 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 switches. So every time when they send something from both of these down here, it comes from this right here as a virtual switches. Okay. So that is a, what we call as a virtual entity, okay, or virtual switches. That's what that is. Okay, this guy underneath here doesn't know what virtual port channel is. They do not. They only a port channel, okay. But from here down, it's a virtual port channel, okay. So now we go detail into the component now, okay, guys. As far as that goes, okay, between the two. Okay, so uh, with the virtual port channel, these are some beneficial that you can see right away, okay? And so, uh, uh, first thing, the beneficial, you can see right here, allow a single device to use a port channel across two upstream devices. What they're talking about is this guy right here, okay? So with the port channel, you cannot do that. You gotta terminate the connection on the adjacent devices, but now with the virtual port channel, we can go across two upstream devices, okay? And of course, because of that, we eliminate the blocking port. See that? Okay. And they are all forwarding. And this is where we're going to look at more feature, you know, uh, within the virtual port channel. Loop free topology, absolutely. Okay. And we are be able to use utilize all link. In other words, not from here. Oh, I utilize all link here. I don't have any blocking because of the virtual port channel. But if you take a look at what I drew earlier between the two switches as far as the adjacent devices, without the port channel, you know what's going to happen, okay? And so, uh, so this is a little better beneficial within the virtual port channel, okay? And of course, if one go down, we got the other. Even if one virtual port channel device go down, we still got the other because at that moment, they got identical information between them. So that's why as far as a beneficial, loop free, available, all uplink, we can use a item. And fast conversion if either link go down or even the devices go down. Okay, so uh, so therefore it given you link redundancy as well as a device redundancy, high availability, resiliency, whatever you call them. Okay, these are all beneficial. Uh, you know, as far as a virtual port channel goes. Okay, so that's what they are. Okay, so giving you a little better of beneficial, and here is a big uh, picture as far as a component. Okay. Well, let's revisit them again. You can see right here, this is the VPC peer. You gotta have two, okay? Not one, not three or four, but only two. The VPC peering only there to synchronize all the configuration in between them and how they synchronize if they are using what we call as a CFS, okay? Which is stand for Cisco Fabric Services. That's what that is. And they will use this feature between them, part of the virtual port channel, to synchronize everything between these two devices, okay? So that's what they are, all right? And no traffic as far as the data traffic between these two right here, only control traffic, what we call them, okay? Control traffic only, that using VPC peering, and they have to be 10 gig each, okay? We also talk a little bit about the keep alive, so that's what have to go up to your core somewhere as a layer three and come down to the other switch. That's the separate interface between these two switches as the layer three interface for the P VPC keep alive. Okay, so that's what between them, we talk a little bit about that already, okay? And so now let's identify additional now, okay? So you can sort of see, okay, these two as a peer, you can see it right here, and of course protocol and synchronization and everything 
are actually using CFS to do between these two right here over the VPC peering, and that's what that is. Okay? Now, because of this, there is an also uh, the connection between these two down to here. Okay, we call this as a VPC membership between this and that, and between this and that. So that's a VPC membership, member port right here. And you can sort of see that right here, uh, line by line. And then from the switch here up, it's all about port channel, uh, the normal port channel, because he doesn't understand the virtual port channel. All he does is I connect it to, the, uh, to my uh, 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 switch on top, okay? And so that's what they are. So, so from here up is about port channel. From here down is a virtual port channel. Okay? And so that's what they are. Okay? And they can do LACP and so on and so forth as well. Now, one other thing, okay, that I'm talking about now is uh, what we call this as a right over here. This interface, okay? Okay? Uh, connected to this right over here. So that is what we call as an orphan interface on this switch because this is not an orphan interface or port. But this is it because they're not part of the virtual port channel because this is not, not like this, okay? So therefore, this is what we call as an orphan interface on that, even on this guy, okay? Now, for this device to not part of this, we call that as an orphan device or orphan interface, same thing, okay? All right, and so now you think about how the traffic gets flow between them, okay? So over here, let's say, assuming I have, uh, you know, the server here, right? That's connected to my orphan device. And I want to be able to talk to the traffic, maybe underneath this guy, to be a part of the virtual port channel from here up, uh, from here down, right? So maybe this is server number one, this is server number two, right? Let's say, for example, if this is the server number one on the orphan device, I need to talk to server number two, the traffic will go into the orphan device switch, and then into this device, and he look at the uh, destination of the, where the server two is, he's going to forward that information and go down this way, okay? So that, that's what that is, okay? And then if this guy need to talk to the orphan device, a server off of the orphan device here, they're gonna go up here, and then for these guys have the same consistent table, okay, and they will go ahead and do it as well. Now, the only exception as far as a VPC peering, where they allow the data traffic to go across here, is this. So think about this right here, guys. If what happened if I have another uh, switch called in as an orphan device, OD, just like that. Okay, as a switch, and then up of here I have the server called the server number three. Say for example, okay, they are off of this switch. They're not off of this. Okay, so now what happened if the switch number one need to talk to the switch number three? How does that gonna happen? Okay, so again the traffic will go from here into this uh, 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 switch where my hand is. Okay, and of, of course because of that he look at the destination right, and he know that it's across here because both of them are the same. And here comes the switch number three. That is not into the, this right here or part of any good right here, right? How are they going to forward the traffic between this and that? Okay, that's the only exception that they allow the traffic to go across the VPC peering for the server one and server three traffic. That's an orphan devices. That's the only exception. Okay, but other than that, there are no traffic as far as the data traffic go across the VPC peering if you are part of the VPC member port. Okay. That's the only exception. But other than that, between these two right here, it's all about control traffic, which is again, that's using the CFS for that reason, okay? And that means that configuration synchronization, all the uh, dynamic information that learned between these two switches, they will use the VPC peering to synchronize between them. Other than that, no data traffic, okay? So that's a little bit about that as well, okay guys? Any question, guys, as far as the virtual port channel? Still doing good? Okay, guys, so that's what a little bit of that, and I don't think we miss anything here, uh, and, you know, as far as, uh, you know, as far as that goes. Okay, guys, so uh, as much detail as I can tell you guys, this is your opportunity. If you're not too clear on a certain component or whatever it is, just please pick up, okay? I'll be more than happy to explain. And I don't think I miss anything because this is a very busy slide here. It's a lot of components that need to be identified and, and do so as well.
Okay, we talk about this, we talk about this, okay, we also talk about the uh, orphan devices, okay, and so, uh, um, and so that's what that is, and I don't think I miss anything, I talk about this right here, okay, and also keep alive, okay, the pair of uh, associate components between these two, not must here, okay, and so, um, so those are the things that we have to identify from the very beginning. Okay, and notice that still, guys, the data right here between these two devices, that's what the virtual port channel will look like, okay, exists, okay. For everything else, it's just a normal port channel. Even for this guy, it doesn't even have a port channel, because it's only got one connection. However, what happens here if you do this? What happens if you do this, okay, from the orphan device, right? What happens if you say, okay, I have another link that I want to go from here to there. Can I do that? Yes. And then can I do a port channel here only? Yes, you can. Absolutely. Okay. Why not? Okay. If you wanted to do it that way. Okay. And so, uh, uh, and so uh, because of that right here, however, if you would have done this, it might well just, uh, you know, take this and go over here. And now all of a sudden, this guy will, will become just a, a normal a virtual port channel, just like the switch here versus the switch here. Same thing. Okay. So you can do very much the same. Okay, depending on what you are doing. Okay, either you want to be part of the orphan device or not, depending on it. If you don't want it, you just provide two connections, one from here to here, one from here to there. Now, why not? It's just like this guy right there. And they will be part of the virtual port channel. Okay, but if you don't, then of course, this is the orphan device, and that's the only exception they allow the traffic to go across here if there is another one on, on the other side. You never know, though. I mean, it all depends on the connectivity and the and the topology that you have, okay? So you can migrate, you can do a lot of things with it. And there are a lot of beneficial as far as the virtual port channel here, okay? Okay, so now because of that, the Nexus do support that. And of course, we gotta go in, first of all, we gotta identify and then we gotta configure. And these are the steps that you can see right over here. First thing first, Nexus always. Anything that you do, you gotta go in and enable the feature for. Okay, <coughs> so you gotta be able to do that. Let me turn off the light and see if the uh, thing make it a little bit better for you guys. Okay, so uh, uh, so you gotta enable the uh, feature first of all from the Nexus to do though. Okay, and then after that you have to go into the config on both of them, and then you have to uh, create the VPC domain. And when you do so, it requires. Okay, you got to come up with a VPC domain for that. Okay, and the switch can only belong to one in one domain only. Never more than that. Okay, all right. And then after that, you got to provide the people line, and I talked about it already between them. Okay, a separate layer three interface connect back to your core, and then of course come down to uh, the other switch. That's the uh, people line. Okay, they don't want you to use a VPC peeling. Okay, to do a people line either. Okay. And so uh, now, optionally, while you are in the config, you can see right here, we will can, uh, take a look at the system priority, okay? If you don't do so, the MAC address will become the uh, breaking point and let you dictate which one to be the primary, which one to be the secondary between the two VPC devices, okay? And that's why they say optional. If you wanted to dictate that, you can do so while you are in the configuration of it, okay? And then because of that, when you do so, if you do so, the, the one, one switch will also be the, the primary one as well, okay? Uh, unless you uh, the, the configure uh, different, uh, you know, even though this is the priority on this switch, uh, right? And then, of course, I want the other one to be a primary row instead of a secondary row. You can also be optionally uh, uh, be able to do so as well, okay? Optionally, it is not required, okay? So usually, if the switch is the primary, Okay, the row will automatically become the primary uh, if they become the, uh, you know, the, the, the primary. Okay, so that's what that is. And so all optionally, if you want to kind of do so as well, lots of options. Okay, and then of course, don't forget the VPC peeling. That's very important. Okay, connect them between them, make them as a port channel between them. Absolutely. Okay. And or if you have an existing port channel configured, right? All you do is just you know move the connection physically and make them as a virtual. Port. They're talking about you know the one we just barely talk about here. Okay, if you say for example, except for this one right here, if you have this device, right, that is already a, a two connection here and it has a you know a port channel there already. Let's say you do, right? And now you want to be make that a part of the 
of this guy. Then all you do is just move the connection to another switch. And then, of course, now you should be able to create the VPC member port. And, and this and that are now part of the, you know, uh, VPC member. Okay. So that's what that is. Okay. If you want to do it that way. Okay. So it all depends on what you currently have and what you are migrating to. Okay. See, that's why I said here, move the port channel to the virtual port channel. Okay. So those are the things that you can also do as well. Absolutely. Now, because of that, the virtual port channel doesn't have to be a single layer. Okay. Think about this again, guys. We talked so much about these two right here with the VPC peeling, a domain, and so on, right? Okay. From here down is a virtual port channel. You can sort of see the dotted line right here. So what happened if, okay, you have another two switches that is below the main one here. And then we want to do a virtual port channel from where my hand is here down to the server. Now, guys, these now this day, all the server out there, as far as a NIC card, the, the CNA interfaces on, on the physical NIC on any one of those servers, they are already support port channel. Okay? In other words, you know, from the NIC here, I can do port channel from here up here. Oh, absolutely, I can. Okay? From even from the server, not a switch. And then from here down to the server, that's a virtual port channel. But if you were to look at this and say, okay, I have the core, I have an aggregation, okay, or I have an aggregation in the core, and then of course I have an access layer, but depending on the, on the switches tab, right, you can see that from here down is a virtual port channel. Even from here down to the server, it's a virtual port channel. So all of a sudden, you got two layers of the virtual port channel, not a single layer. So the virtual port channel can be, you know, can be provisioned as a multiple layer, not as a single, okay? And then from the server up is a port channel, but from here down is a virtual port channel. And again, from here up here, as you can sort of see connection here and there, that's a virtual port channel. So here, here, different domain even, you see that, okay? Because of that, okay? Any given switch or switches can, you know, belong to only a single domain only, but never more than that, okay? The two switches belong to the single domain when you configure virtual port channel. The two right here when you configure the uh, domain is a real different domain. Okay, and all of a sudden from the from the topology you got multiple layer, not as a single. Okay, so that's a good thing. Okay, you can do a lot of things with it, and there is a feature within the virtual port channel. Okay, we call it the peer gateway. Now think about this right here. Okay, what happened if Okay, uh, this guy is the uh, uh, is a default gateway because technically these two right here might not be the gateway. They're layer two switches. The five gate is a layer two, but be between this and that, it's a virtual port channel. Between here and up, it's a it's a it's a port channel from here up, right? And then now the server say, okay, where is my default gateway at? Well, according to this, right, you can think about this seven uh, ka might be my default gateway. Okay, and of course, you know, they're gonna go ahead and do a forwarding. Now, one more thing that I will mention it right now, as far as a, a, a later on on the second section that talk about the first hop, <coughs> excuse me, first hop redundancy protocol, okay? Uh, think about this right here as far as, uh, you know, uh, could be later on as a hot standby routing protocol, okay? And we have a GLBP, Okay, and we also have a GLBP, we have a VRRP as well, okay? So any one of these are first half redundancy protocol. So now, because of that, this is my virtual port channel going down here, okay? Let's say, for example, if I'm running hot standby routing protocol later, okay? Uh, not the picture they dictated here, but between these two right here, we're running this, right? And of course, say one of them will be the, uh, the, the active, the other one will be the standby, say, for example, okay? And so now, if we think about it, right, if this guy is an active, okay, and this guy is a standby from, the, from this point of view. Now, because of that, the, 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 uh, between these two right here, there is a virtual IP address exists between these two and that right there, okay? So if that is the case, now, if this is an active, this is the standby, when the server going up, right, according to this, if it hit the standby, now, technically, they have to go across here for the active to go forwarding. But Cisco already make the modification based on this, on a virtual port channel, right? With the hot standby here. When that happened, they allow both of these guys right here to do a forwarding so that we do not utilize the 
VPC peering here to go uh, say, okay, this is my default gateway or either way, either way you look at it, right? If this is not the default gateway or even if it is, then of course this CI is inactive, the standby is not allowed to do anything from original. But now with this, they already make a modification. Okay, so now when the traffic hit this guy, he's a standby, he allowed to do forwarding. Not even this guy, but this guy allowed forwarding, not the gateway. Okay? They already make some modification under those routing protocol as far as the first hub redundancy protocol because of being a virtual port channel. The reason is the main thing is we do not allow the traffic to go across the VPC peeling right here. Okay, that's why both of these, even though they are active standby and vice versa, right? They are all allowed forwarding. Okay, and that feature is within the virtual port channel. Okay, a little bit later, we're going to see how we implement all of that, not just the virtual port channel here, but additionally, we have this, okay, as a, as a you know, redundancy, okay. So, uh, if you are with me later on section, I'll talk more about that as well. This is one of the features allow any devices on top to do a forwarding for us, okay, as far as a gateway. Now, as far as a, another feature within a virtual port channel, we call it as a peer switch. Now, the whole thing about peer switch is that allow the conversion to go very, very, very quick. You're talking, uh, you know, within a microsecond, if that is the case, with the peer switch, okay? This is all about conversion, okay? How fast can they actually act it, or uh, so on? Then that's what the peer, uh, peer switch look like, okay? It's all about, you know, converted uh, timing, okay? How fast can they go act it, okay, for whatever that is, so... Okay, guys, so that's what I have on this section, okay, as far as a little bit about port channel, virtual port channel. And, and these concepts, when you're taking tests later, it's going to be important, and they're going to they're gonna ask you a lot for it, and, unless, you know, if you already taking the DCCOR with me earlier, then, of course, you know, some of this section, it's the very first one we don't cover because of self-study, okay, and it's important concept very detailed and you have to understand in order for you to understand the whole thing and you know to take tests and so on but that's important okay guys so at this moment i think i don't have anything on this anymore so uh, i do have another section that coming up a little bit later today for the first half redundancy protocol for today so if you guys are coming back hopefully we'll see you guys then okay guys other than that uh, any questions for me guys okay as far as the section i have right now